Hey, 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 family. Welcome back to my channel. This is Pearl Osa, and you've joined me on Life of Interruptions. I'm sending you peace, love, joy, and happiness to whatever part of the world that you are in, whatever time zone, whatever language you speak, whatever frame of mind you are in, and whatever state of health that you might be in today. You can hear that my voice has done a bit of a walk away, but we're pushing through, and she'll be back soon, and we'll be okay. We're going to do this thing anyway. Um, I want you to hit the like, the subscribe, and the notification bell so that you know every time we load something new which is usually every Friday we're trying to be consistent so hope you got anyhow today I'm talking about a very topical issue and it is the issue of sexual purity you will recall in my first video that I shared that when I made the decision to go into a covenant of sexual purity I used my hair as a symbol and that also um, when I was making that covenant to worship with my hair that um, you know I cut it off and start it again but I want to just depart from the point of using my hair as a sign or a symbol for my choice to remain sexually pure if I think about it I don't know about any young girl growing up at the age of five six seven saying oh I can't wait to grow older just so I can sleep with every man in the neighborhood I don't know that that's the reality. I think that very often as girls we grow up with this romanticized view of sex. We can't we don't even know about sex to be honest. We just think about our wedding day and every little girl plans her white dress and plans her her wedding and how she's going to be swooped off her feet by her knight in shining armor. That's where our focus is. There's there's no girl that I know of ever who has just spoken about how she's going to you know, sleep with anything that is available um, before she gets married. So that, I was one of those girls that I know of who had made the decision that I was going to stay sexually pure before marriage. This was just my, you know, it was my plan. Um, but it was not to be. It was not to be and I just feel as though there were all sorts of forces that just conspired to ensure that it was not to be from, um, you know, things that we would see in the, in, the, in the society, the environment in which we grew up, um, pedophilic elements that just pose around as, as big brothers and uncles and what have you, um, the pressure from teenage boys put on each other to have conquests. Uh, it's, it's just, it, there was a lot of that going on. I want to talk about it today because I know, I know, I know it's not just me. And I know in South Africa currently there is this big um, focus right now on gender-based violence because it is at epidemic proportions. Um, so we need to be talking about it. And I want to talk about my experience where I think it started from which I think would be similar to the experience of so many young girls so that we can introspect, you know, as society. Um, look back and see where we can fix things. This is my little contribution to the conversation. So as I said, you would remember in my video I spoke about um, using my hair, one, as an element of worship, but also as a sign to this decision that I had made to stay sexually pure, um, that it was going to grow in its natural state till I got married, just as a symbol of this. And this was all part of this walk that I say that I'm on of returning back to the original woman that I was created to be in the original image and likeness that God had made me in. So um, if I just step back and try and think of where I lost it along the way, it was like really from a very early, very, very early age. We're talking about um, an uncle that was in the same house that I grew up with who introduced me to these touching games, you know, um, and you'd move from there into the community playing with other children and they would play mummy and daddy and go behind curtains and you know do all sorts of stuff um i remember even being in in primary school and being stalked by um full-grown men there was a a medical well there was a man who was near my primary school who claimed to be a doctor um and he would come and talk to us every day and I was lured to his office this one day. He lured me to his office under the pretext that I'm a doctor, um, my office is next door. I have these real life-sized um, models of the muscles and the skeleton and of the human eye. You know, those interesting things. Come see, come see in my office. So I follow him eagerly and we get there and he's like, oh, my door is locked. Oh, my security guard is not around. Okay, while we wait for him, let's just wait for him. And he reaches down and starts to lift up 
my dress, my school uniform, and I ran. I had not hit the age of 10 yet. <coughs> Sorry, if my memory serves me correctly. I was somewhere between the ages of seven, eight, nine, somewhere there. In that same period, there was uh, another guy who was, just, I think he was in the neighborhood, who would stalk me, just stalk me around. I'd be at the salon with my mom getting her hair done. I'd step out to play, there he'd be in this car. Um, you know, he would just he, he'd pop up. Or um, traders walking on the streets with their wares. I remember one particular one who just used to scream obscenities at me every time I'd take the walk home. So there was just this, these elements in society. And as I grew and hit puberty, it was um, respectable men in the community. You know, I remember one time my mom sent me to uh, quite an elderly man who was connected through family connections in the community. He lived in the same compound. It was like a cluster, cluster homes. And they had uh, one of the um, buildings in this um, compound. So she sent me to take a message from someone to him. I get there and he was reaching out. I mean, he grabbed at my, at the time, recently budding breast. I mean, this I was in his home with his, his um, older children who were much, much, much older than me. I mean, they were varsity age. His wife, his grandchildren were in the house, you know. Um, and you walk away from these experiences just saying to yourself, there's got to be something wrong with me. Now, I didn't grow up with my father, um, so I, I'm not really at this time clear on how um, engagement or re relationships ought to be between male and female. But something is not sitting right. Because the message I'm getting is that all I am is my body. That's the message that I'm getting at, at, at such a young age. I came back from high school. I went to boarding school. I came back from high school once, and um, a gentleman came over to visit my mom, and you know he was just passing through the neighborhood oh popped in oh this is where you live and she's like oh yeah funny enough my daughter's just returned from high school so there i am for me this is uncle you know and i'm talking to him with the highest form of respect and he was not a small fry quite a uh upstanding man in society had done well for himself businessman and he was like oh what a coincidence nice to see you. Listen, I'm just passing through, I'm not staying, but I would have brought you something. Come to my office tomorrow and I have um, a gift for you. I'll, I'll give you some money, some spending money for the holiday. Guys, you must know, I had started to apportion that money. I had plans, I had bought things in my head. I was ready, you know. Little did I know that it was gonna come at a price. So I go to his office the next day and there I am, all the polite talk. You know, I think he would ask me as most uh, of my mother's friends did male or female how are you doing in school what do you want to do when you grow up those are the normal conversations you have with a child my age I was in my early mid-teens at the time and this man comes away from his desk he walks across the room to me and he pulls me into an embrace like I'm a full-grown woman I mean he's grabbing at my body parts and then I look at his desk and there's a picture of a, of a girl looks about my age and I say to him who's that he says it's his daughter. I'm like, we look the same age. What are you doing? What is this? You know, I'm thinking, I didn't think I would have to pay a price for some little pocket money. The fact that he had said this in front of my mom obviously gave me that sense of freedom <laughs> to come out and get this money. I turned around, I walked away. I was not going to be for sale. I felt so filthy, so used. Again, this message had been reinforced. We don't care about your future. We don't care about what's between your ears. Um, you're only... As, as important as what's between your legs is literally the message and, and through all of this I kept saying I'm going to be a virgin I'm going to keep myself pure you know so you're fighting through this in society um, in school it was just an uphill battle I don't I, I, I was usually approached by older boys um, not the people in my age group and of course the older girls um, were not really keen on that arrangement um, but it was as it was and so I garnered a lot of reputational issues I remember that people would would you know go to the classrooms and draw my genitals carve them out 
you know, draw female genitalia on uh, the wooden tables and draw them on toilet doors and what have you. And I had friends who would, you know, during the day, school, they'd comb through the classrooms and if they saw that kind of thing, they would help me use sandpaper or a sharp object and try and scratch, scratch that out. It was just, it, it was chasing me everywhere and the rumors abound. I would say something in a completely different um, topic, but it always, I would see the eyes, the looks exchange, and people were always just assuming that I was, uh, you know, sexually active. And when I was growing up, you need to know that <coughs> it, wasn't, <clears throat> it wasn't a thing of pride to have lost your virginity. We grew up in an era where you wanted to keep that virginity. It was a thing of pride, it was what you spoke about. The girls who were loose, the girls who were sleeping around, even if we thought they were sleeping around, they were ostracized, they were talked about, they were put at arm's length. Um, and I knew that I was in the category of girls who was like determined to stay prim and proper, yet the talks around me, the accusations, you know, I would just hear things about myself in whispers and, um, and it seemed that I became almost like a conquest that one had to to have. There was a, a guy that I was dating in high school. Now dating in high school meant that he would hold your hand and walk you to dorm after um, evening classes. You know, that was just it. It was exchanging letters, there was holding of hands and there was walking. There was that exclusivity in the relationship. That's all we did. Maybe, you know, the really senior girls at a really later stage in the relationship might graduate to a kiss. But it was just not the done thing, you know. So this guy who I was dating now came and sat with me one fateful day. I will never forget this day. Sat with me just before the evening classes were about to start. For me, it was the most normal thing. We're sitting, we're supposed to be talking. And the way that our classrooms were structured, there was a block of classrooms, then there was a, an open, like, park, you know, patch of grass, and then across from that, there was another block, block of classrooms. And you could see from this block to the other block by virtue of the windows, you know, on both sides. So what he did was that we had the desks and desks and chairs, desks and chairs lined up alongside the windows, you know, on either side. And he sat me on the chair and sat higher above me on the table. Now, I didn't know, and my assumption till today is that he had made a bet with the boys to prove this reputation about how loose and how easy I was. He'd made a, a bet with the boys, I think, but whatever way, he sat me down facing that, facing the window, which means that the people in the classrooms across the park also sitting at the window could look and see what was happening at these windows. And our backs were turned to everyone in the classroom that was with us at the time. Again, I'm, I'm not thinking, I think it's just a conversation. So we're talking. And um, he puts his hand on my shoulder. We're talking, that's normal. But he had positioned me at the window so that he could slip his hand into my dress and fondle at my breasts. Um, and he had told them he was going to do this and that they should watch and see. When the hand went there, this is the first and the last time that he had ever done anything. It was not a part of our relationship. It was not the norm. But clearly that's not what he's been saying to his boys. And he doesn't want to look like a, you know, a weakling in front of them. He wants to look like the guy who could get the girls and make them do what it is he wants. So he puts his hand in the... I freeze. I freeze. I felt filthy and all of these grown men who had tried to reach for my chest and people who had who had had conversations with me but would not look in my eyes would look at my chest and people who had touched me you know it all came back at this moment and, and it was reinforced this is all that i'm worth this is this is my value it's on my chest or between my legs it's all i'm worthy of really and to know that i had been watched and I was going to be the conversation. Yo, oh, if I could blush, I think I had gone beetroot red. I just felt filthy. It took me a long time to forgive that act. And I had to forgive it for my own good. And this person reached out to me on Facebook to be friends. I just couldn't tell. <laughs> I couldn't say yes. And I'm sure he cleaned his forgotten. What does he know? Because he was a, a, a boy at the time operating off some bet. 
you know, trying to show some macho, but you know, you're showing macho with someone's life, someone's destiny. And those were, those were mild in comparison to the things that happen today. Today, boys are drugging their schoolmates and they're gang raping them and they're filming this and they're putting it on social media. You know, so that element and that behavior has always been, but it's been because we had boys who just thought that girls were there for their pleasure. Um, they didn't think anything about their feelings, uh, their emotions. It's, it's been reported today that the highest um, incidence of teenage depression are amongst the sexually active. There are teenage girls today who say that they have boyfriends, they want to hang with the boyfriends, they want to talk, they want to speak on the phone for long hours and send WhatsApp messages. That's what girls look for. But they are not able to get into those deep things because they report that till they've given their boyfriend sex, he barges and he barges and he bugs and he bugs. And so she's given him that sex, then there's not going to be any conversation. And if she doesn't give him that sex, he will call her names, um, he will he would make her feel bad, he would not talk to her. All of the things that she's actually looking for, she would not get. And so this just goes to prove that a lot of us, um, as girls, are having sex so that we can get to what it is we want. But that's not what we want, it's not what we're looking for. When I eventually became sexually active, it was out of a, a rape uh, situation with a man that was about twice my age, literally. and. Um, yeah. So after that, for me, it was like, it, this thing has been concretized. I received the message and received it and received it. Now I get it. This is my worth. Um, this is this is this is the only way I'm going to be appreciated or or accepted or pulled into the fold or conversed with and at that point it was like i kept this thing up until this point regardless of what people said regardless of what people did so why now should i keep there's nothing to hold on to anymore there's nothing to and i just let rip i just couldn't be bothered that became the defining point of um relationships and i think i got into a place where i was um looking to prove a point you know, looking to prove a point that I couldn't be used anymore, that I couldn't be belittled anymore. So I just became random. I don't even know another way to, to express it. But how many people have this story? How many people is this true for? How many people is it worse for, you know? Male and female, by the way, how many people will tell you that as men, they became homosexual because they were raped by someone who they had trusted, who they knew, who was known to the society, or known in the society, or known by their parents, etc. It, it, it's a very real situation. And it goes back to how we are raising boys. It goes back to how sexualized our society is. I mean, you can't sell a chocolate without trying to sexualize it. You can't sell paint without trying to sexualize it. At my local, um, business center where you you do your printouts and um, photocopying and posters etc the whole artwork inviting you into their um establishment is of a sexual nature it's a woman uh, they're trying to show you um how their their photography is so on point and not pixelated etc etc you know and so they've got this thing expanded at high resolution but it's it's a woman with her nipples erect it's another picture i think of um i don't even know what it's called uh, where they have the it's a form of, of depraved sex activity with the, the bands and the leather and the whips and the what have you. These are the pictures at a business center where all I want to go and do is print pictures. It's everywhere. I drive the streets, you know, and my children are of um, the age where they can start to read. I get worried because, you know, it's the posters that they see. It's the billboards of um, your sexual industry that are all over the place. It's, it's headlines of a sexual nature. I can't protect them from that stuff anymore. I've walked through, I remember a time we had to walk through um, uh, North Taxi Rank with my youngest boy. Well, he was my first at the time, but at the time I think he wasn't even up to three, four, thereabouts. And as we walk past trying to get into a taxi, there on the street is um, 
a whole bunch of pornographic material. They're just on the street like that. And I remember praying. I said, you know, he's looking at these images. He might not even know what they mean, but there's an imprint in his mind that, you know, the enemy will seek to bring to the fore, you know, just go through the memory files on the day appointed and bring that to the fore. And I keep praying, you know, for the blotting out of those images from his memory, from his psyche, you know. So these things are there and our boys are subjected to that. Our girls are subjected to that, to this pornography, to soft porn. It's a soft war on the minds of men, women, boys and girls. And people are looking for an outlet. You've got poverty as another, um, you know, cause for this pandemic in the sense that you've got little girls who need to bring home the cheddar and are involved in all forms of prostitution and they bring you home money to parents who know, who know, sometimes the parents know what the child is up to and they encourage it, sometimes they pimp them out themselves because people need to eat. You've got child-headed households. Um, we heard once of a story of a little girl, she was five or six at the time, she had been orphaned, both her parents dead from AIDS and she stayed in the shack and she would go to school every day, excuse me, she would go to school every day and um, that's where she would get her only meal for the day. But when she would come back, she stayed in this really thick, uh, dense, um, informal settlement. Uh, her shack was in the mist somewhere at the back and she had to go through these gangs. And the boys made her pay every day with her body. They would gang rape her, five or six of them. Um, sorry, she was about five or six years old. And they would gang rape her for her to be able to get home to a place of safety and go to school the next morning. So this stuff is happening. It's happening. We are dying at a rate of a couple of seconds every woman dies in this nation and in nations across the world. Um, they're beaten by partners who they, they love and have committed themselves to. And yes, there is the issue of being at the wrong place at the wrong time. And yes, we could train our girls. And yes, we could talk to them about what they're wearing. I believe in all of that, but it's not, the, it's not the root cause. It's not the root cause. There is something that sits within the mind of such a sick and depraved person that then is triggered when you see a certain outfit or see, and you know how you know? Because an individual could be dressed as chastely as possible. She's dressed decently, she's minding her business, she's going to school, she's a baby, nothing has developed, there's nothing to trigger a response from that kind of man and yet he would still respond in that way and still rape we've got people being raped at the age of nine months <coughs> excuse me all the way to grannies at the age of 80 something i heard of a granny who had been so brutally raped that even though she was taken care of physically it broke her psyche her her she broke her emotionally to the point that she just couldn't be saved and she died. She didn't die from what had happened to her physically. She died from a deep depression. To be raped and humiliated and violated to that extent by a child. I mean, this boy was a child. And, and some of us have um, some of these boys coming home where mothers receiving these boys. We know what they get up to. We know their reputation in the community. We don't give them up. They are gangsters. They bring home big money and we keep them in the house. And in the house, they're, they're beating their mothers. Some of them are raping their mothers, but um, they're held at fear. They're held with guns to their head, some of these mothers, and there's nothing they can do. I know that there's the other extreme where you've got the blessers and the blessy clubs. You've got women who have just yielded to this thing and said, you know, at the very least I'm going to get something out of it. You know, I know you're a married man. I know you're chasing after me. Uh, and I'll give you what you want, but I'm going to do it for the security, you know. And so they're going after these older men, and, and these men are setting them up in apartments, uh, luxury apartments, giving them luxury cars, and trips abroad, and holidays, and Louis Vuitton bags, and um, etc. But in as much as I don't condone that behavior, I am very reluctant to ignore the possibility that that girl who is now this glorified prostitute, got to that point because society told her, that's all you're worth. And then she got to that point where she was just like, you know what, okay, then let's do this thing. I'm at least, at the very least, I'm gonna get something out of it. I'm not going to just be used 
um, and abused and get nothing from it, you know. We were watching a documentary recently about, uh, what are they called, um, honor, pleasure marriages in the Arab states, I think it was Iraq specifically. Pleasure marriages that were um, conducted for anything from 30 minutes to an hour to a day to a weekend. And these women who had been widowed or, or divorced and were in economic dire straits were being sold, some of them sold by clerics three times in one night to three different men um, who would then use them and give them money and then leave. And they felt, and, and many of them are coming for this because they want violent sex that they can't get in other places. So by the time they're done, they feel really, really degraded. And they were talking about girls as young as nine, um, virgins that were 13 years old, and the clerics would tell the men, uh, you cannot disvirgin her because of what happens with honor killings if a girl is found when she eventually marries again and is found to not be a virgin. So you can't disvirgin her, but you can have anal sex with her. So here you are treating this young girl, and the, when the, the guy was asking, the one who was on the who was the undercover um, investigator, was saying, okay, but what if it hurts her? And the cleric was just like, you know what? That's between you and her. I don't want to get involved. She's been granted to you by that time. It is halal because I blessed it as a cleric. Whatever it is you want to do, if she will allow you, I'm not involved. How does a nine-year-old girl allow or not allow? How did I allow at the age three, four, five, this uncle um, who was on cocaine at the time, by the way, how did I allow him or not allow him to gyrate all over me and to touch me between my legs. The young girl who was recently raped um, at the Dross uh, restaurant in Pretoria, I think it was, how did she or not allow, uh, allow or not allow when she goes to the bathroom and her mother finds this man with his penis in her mouth? How did she allow or not allow? Guys, we are a sick society. There's stuff going on. And the reality in my story is that when I didn't have a voice, when I didn't have a choice, I was at the mercy of many. When I grew to have a voice, I, I assumed that that was the only voice, that was the only thing my voice should say to be relevant. And because I was looking for that acceptance, I continued on that, on that trajectory. But you know what, I always say, and I usually say it jokingly, but today I'm gonna say it um, with a very straight face. I thank God for Jesus, because when he came back and just told me, the fact that people have said this is who you are and said this is what you're worth, doesn't mean that's what I made and fashioned you to be in the first place. And it's never too late to start again. So I got the opportunity to start again. I made that choice to say, forget what they've done, forget how it started, forget the root cause, I'm here. I can start again. I can actually forgive those who brought me to this point. More importantly, I can train up my nine boys and train up my girl. Today when I do her hair, I tend her to her brothers, go ask your brothers how your hair looks. Ask your daddy how your hair looks. I don't want the first place that she heard a compliment to be on the street. Because then that's how we as women are attracted to what we hear. And if we're hearing a sense of our worth and our beauty on the streets where there are strings attached, you need to know that the next thing that might happen is not what you want to happen. So it's best that she hears it at home. And I've told her, when they tell you on the street how pretty you look, tell them, I've already heard that, I'm not moved. I, I'm not I'm not being affirmed by you by for the first time. My affirmation comes from a greater place. It comes from people who I know don't want anything from me, so they must really mean it, you know. And I need to question your intents and your motives. And it's sad that we are living in such a world, but it is the reality. So mother of boys, you have a responsibility. Fathers of boys, you have a responsibility. Girl, child you have a responsibility. You do not need to be defined by that groping hand. You don't have to be defined by, I mean, you sleep at night and you don't sleep dreaming about how you're gonna get up and be touched, how you're gonna get up and be sexualized. You dream about travel to space. You dream about being the first female president. You dream about standing on big stages, your voice being heard, composing beautiful songs and poetry. Keep those dreams alive. And no matter what someone tries to tell you in the physical, you have that power and there is someone around you who will listen when they tell you if you tell anybody i'll kill you it's a lie it's a lie they tell you if you tell anybody i'll you know and they keep the one person doesn't listen someone will listen eventually tell a teacher at school go to the police station please contact me um, my details are on this on this youtube channel 
contact me on my Instagram page, on my Facebook page, through this, and tell me, and let's get you the help you need. But I want you to know that your worth transcends your, uh, your, your private parts. Your worth is in the reason that you were brought to this earth and that great stage you're going to stand upon and that great destiny that you're going to fulfill and the legacy that you're going to leave behind. And don't let anyone tell you different. Today, I have a completely different story. Um, and I wasn't always this self-aware, this self-confident. I mean, I've had incidents of, of, I arrived at a boyfriend's house once playing wifey. Early in the morning, I was going to go, um, you know, start arranging for meals that I wanted to cook, you know, proving to this person that I could be good wife material or whatever it was that was motivating me at the time. And I arrived there early that morning, I see his car and where I would usually park my car is another car parked and I'm knocking, no answer. I'm knocking, no answer. I'm banging, no answer. This again is in a cluster. It's early in the morning because I wanted to come and sort things out and plan this thing before the shops open. Early Saturday morning, people are still sleeping in. I am banging. I start screaming, no answer. I know this person is in there. I want you to look at me in all of my glory and imagine what I did next. I scaled the fence. I jumped over the fence to look for what? Yeah, I know what I was looking for and I found it. I got in there and I found him with some other lady and he's saying to me, oh, no, 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 nothing happened. We were at the club last night together. She was intoxicated. I didn't want her to drive home in that state. So I made her come uh, over here. You know, years later when he and I had broken up because she was known to us, she was known to us both. She calls me and she says, you know, I just called to apologize about what it is I did in your relationship or what I did. Uh, by that time, I was just like, it's over. All of that led me to this place where I am completely valued, um, where I'm loved, um, where my worth is beyond that, where sex is of mutual consent and agreement <clears throat> and is a form of worship and a form of agreement at a family altar. It all led me there. You know, you, you come down roads that you look back and you're saying, what was I thinking? How did I get there? And I'm just grateful to not be there anymore. Today I'm in a marriage where I've got a man who makes me look back at all those exes and say thank you. Thank you for breaking my heart. Thank you for stepping away. Thank you for not being the one that I ended up with. Um, I'd rather find out your true colors then than make a permanent commitment and not be able to get out of it and not be able to change and not be the woman that I am today and find out all the gifts, the talents, the ability, the worth that was actually put in me. When my husband first met me, he didn't meet me as my husband at this point. He was just, um, you know, speaking. And I was there where he was speaking. So I went to him afterwards with no intentions, no attraction, just to say that was powerful. And he looked at me. He also had no attraction to me, but he was just speaking, call it a prophetic moment. And he said to me, you know, what pains me for our girls is that they achieve many things but when it comes to the area of marriage, they are so, um, you know, so, they fail so many times there because they just, the one, the one that was meant for them, the one that has the key to unlock them, doesn't come to the fore. And so they stay locked. He says to me, whatever you do, I just pray for you that you end up with the one who's got the key um, that can open you. And he didn't even know he was speaking. Uh, for himself. And this was a man who honored me when we were in courtship. He would say over me every single day, every day without fail. He will send me in messages. He signed off the messages at the end of the message, my virtuous woman. And I kept looking at this guy. I'm like, virtue, <laughs> virtue. I dropped that thing a long time ago. I don't know about virtue. Though at this time I was now on this walk, I'd been a few years into my journey of abstinence. <clears throat> but still, my sense of worth in that regard, the town would refer to me as virtuous, <laughs> was still not put together. And I used to say, when the Lord eventually told us, listen, here's what's going on, you guys are going to be married. I, apart from the fact that he might not have been the model that I thought I wanted, you know, um, with everything that he, he was, it was just like, no, that's not, I, I said I wanted an investment banker, was, you know, this was a discussion, I'm looking for someone in this line of business, not that line of business, little did I know. But um, the one prayer that I prayed at that time was, please don't let me mess up this man's destiny. This is a good, upstanding guy. I invite you to read the story in the Bible 
um, in the book of Hosea, where Hosea is told to go, he was a priest, pristine priest, and he was told, go and marry a prostitute. In fact, the instruction was not go and marry a prostitute, the instruction was go and love a prostitute, love. Because <laughs> you can marry, but to bring your heart into that place where it loves, that's not the kind of thing you think you can do just because someone said to do it, you know. It's got to, but that's where you learn that love is not a feeling, it's a decision um, based on the truth. So he was instructed to go and love this prostitute, and he did, and he loved her, and they had children, and the children were not his, but he would take those children in, and he would love them and nurture him like his own anyway. And that, I guess, is the story of how our Lord has dealt with us, you know, has also dealt with us. So, um... My prayer for this man was don't, 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 don't. Find him some good girl, you know, some good church girl who's, who was the virgin that I always hoped I would be. The gift I thought I'd give my husband, I don't have to give him anymore. I can't, don't make me the one, someone else. But it was not to be, I was the one. And um, he spoke this over me every day. He washed me with the word, like water. You are a virtuous woman, you are a virtuous woman, you are a virtuous woman. Today I am, um, on our wedding day I was. Um, so it's possible, it's possible. Don't sit in the definition that society has made for you. I wanna call every lost girl, call her out of that place where she's been locked, call her out of that abuse, call her out of that place she defined and locked herself into. Say, let's start again today. For you, it might not be cutting your hair, it might not be, but you can start again today. Help exists. I love you, God bless you. Love you much, love you plenty.